great to be here um, in Rome, but in also in the Canadian Embassy. Um, it is so nice to see all the friends and, and colleagues, and particularly water. Uh, some of you in the Rome party don't know that uh, uh, I actually did a, a doctorate uh, uh, almost 20 years ago. Well, in fact, more than 20 years ago, we graduated almost 20 years ago uh, uh, under Walter's guidance, and that's how um, I was uh, sent off into this field of carbohydrate nutrition, and it kept me thinking about these uh, subjects for all these past 20 some years. So, Walter, this is a progress report uh, for you. Um, anyway, so the day that I w uh, today I wanted to organize this uh, my talk is to uh, review a little bit about a great background so that you have a context of why I uh, use that title for my talks. And I'm um, trying to convince you, in fact, uh, you know, not an opinion that I'm going to in, impart on you, but uh, really is the data is everywhere now as I see it, that there are these sex differences existing in cardiometabolic health, uh, and also some of the related risk factors throughout the lifespans. Um, and why the important roles of uh, disease, uh, important roles of sex steroids, and uh, particularly the sex hormone binding globulins, uh, emerge is one of the uh, uh, important, if not the most important, risk factors in the pathogenesis of uh, diabetes. And then, in that context, I would quickly review why I think that that we can use that yet another biomarkers as say a a monitor. Of, uh, to monitor the uh, potential adverse effects of lifestyle, including uh, diet and particularly carbohydrates. And then I would uh, offer a little bit of perspective for the future. Now this basically is a somewhat complicated uh, slide, but I tried to simplify it in such a way to summarize it, uh, the most uh, uh, cutting edge of understandings of the pathogenesis of uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, we all know that uh, it's important to impair glucose, uh, impair insulin secretion, as well as actions are the two fundamental features of uh, type 2 diabetes. But over uh, the course of the past uh, two decades or so, we have come to gradually realize there's in fact multiple things that allow us to actually taking, uh, as Warm uh, was alluded to earlier, not only one aspect of uh, uh, the science, but also the entire field, all the way from the uh, under our understandings of evolutionary biologies down to molecular biologies, in fact, nutritions, um, that have uh, uh, allow us to reconstruct this pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes that also integrated the mechanisms of uh, metabolisms, immunities, and reproduction. And highlighted here uh, at the top, uh, I don't have a pointer, so I don't know how uh, uh, can point at the top on purpose, is that in fact, uh, we now uh, have established fairly conclusively that an, uh, endogenous sex steroids uh, are important, and yet there are sex dimorphisms in, in, in explaining those uh, effects of sex steroids on diabetes risk. And obviously, uh, those are come down to uh, uh, many of the uh, genetic levels, because most of these biomarkers uh, floating in the blood, are, are, there are a lot, and they are highly correlated, and sometimes it's difficult to illustrate it, uh, which one is the cause and which one is the effect, and that's the reason why there's uh, now opportunities with all these technologies that allow us to capture all these human uh, gemline mutations at mass say, and that would allow us to tease apart some of the relationships. Now, the reason why I lay out this is that within this context, it really should provide some guidance for us to think about uh, diet. And this is just data, uh, again, a, sum, a summary of a meta-analysis done uh, uh, almost 10 years ago now, showing actually beautifully uh, men and women are different in terms of looking at test, uh, testosterone. So in fact, testosterone is actually protective if you think uh, of uh, type, uh, the developing type 2 diabetes in men, but the opposite effects are observed in, in women. And that is just cross-sessional. There's many uh, uh, clinical, small-scale clinical study to consistently demonstrate that. And we were the one that first 
uh, in again two uh, prospective cohort studies uh, at, at Harvard. One is the physician's health study, another one is the a, a woman's health study showing that, for example, in men, uh, very clear protective effect prospectively uh, testosterone comparing the two extreme quartile, you see almost a reduction, uh, more than half a reduction in risk. And this risk has actually become slightly reduced a little bit if you put uh, uh, SHBG, the sex hormone binding globulin, into the model, which further indicated the importance of this uh, binding protein. Whereas in women, this is uh, uh, also prospective, you see a completely different picture. Testosterone is now, this is all um, adjusted for or controlled for all the no uh, uh, confounding factors, including, uh, including BMI, obesity. Now, as I indicated, as I mentioned earlier, the problem with this is that we, we, should, we see this data now is very consistent, prospectively, not only by us now, and I will show again also in the Women's Health initiative, initiative data as well. When this paper was first uh, published uh, in, in Diabetes Lodgers, we got a lot of criticism, one of which is, of course, confounding factors. There are many biomarkers in the blood that might be correlated with SHBG level, which subsequently uh, leads to the risk of diabetes as well. But as I uh, indicated uh, before, so if you do have, however, the uh, GM9 mutation, this is exactly the case, and we, uh, that would allow us to search to see if that the GM9 mutation of the gene that code for SHBG also directly predictive of risk of diabetes. And in this case, we find two functional uh, GM9 mutations in the gene that code for SHBG, in fact, one uh, positive, another one is negative, and together they can not only predictive of the plasma phenotype of the protein itself, but also the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And then we can incorporate those uh, genetic variants as an instrument to control the confounding factors that allow us to fairly conclusively uh, uh, prove that this indeed is uh, a causal the relationship. As I uh, already mentioned, this fairly consistently, subsequently looking at across three populations. In fact, uh, of all the biomarkers one look at, we have not yet found biomarkers as consistent as the uh, sex hormone binding globulin. And this is the Women's Health Initiative uh, data across uh, all the uh, ethnic groups using Mendelian randomization, except in this time, we have the whole genome uh, scan data to show that. Now, if the sex hormone uh, binding globulins, not only the genotype, but also the phenotypes are so important, and it suggests to us uh, it got to be something even more uh, in capturing the effect of the sex steroid pathway. And some of you who are familiar with this field, you know that the sex steroid is extremely difficult to measure because they are lipids, uh, and that's one of the reasons that leads to a lot of the inconsistencies in the literature, primarily because of the method for assay it's difficult, and yet for SHBG, however, it's just a protein, fairly accurately uh, measured, it's just a simple ELISA. So the data that I indicated before was just focusing on the candidate genes, but now, aside from our assessments of SHBG, we now look at the whole genome and mass and that's some of the works that we were able to do. This is also in the Women's Health Initiative, and I'm going to show very fast in the next uh, few slides Everything essentially should pop up uh, in red, uh, passing the so-called FDR significance, meaning it's a forced discovery, uh, discovery rate adjustment significance. It's more than the p-values, okay? So everything in red is uh, uh, highly significant. So there's, you can tell we find many uh, potential signals that pop up across different uh, 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 genes that govern the sex steroid pathways, roughly about 32 of them. And then our pathway analysis, of course, extends to the whole genomes. Uh, in the interest of time, I, I really don't have the time to go through the entire pathway analysis, but suffice it to say that we, uh, uh, some of those pathways are actually quite uh, novel, we identify, indicating, again, a, a potential sex differences um, that 
that it's related to some of the wear variants that we identify too, for example, MPC ones. And I also uh, have a couple that, uh, and, and some of you are probably aware of the PCSK, uh, PCSK9, uh, the one that uh, just come out with an antibody uh, that targeted that lower LDL. And all of which uh, seem to have this sex uh, uh, um, as a uh, effect modifier. Then we go back to, again, this is a, uh, data from the uh, NHANS uh, 3 and 4 uh, data, roughly about 20 years, um, where they actually quite care, although they are not uh, nutritional epidemiologists, we can criticize them uh, whether or not they use the statistical model correctly. But they uh, care in a sense, they just counting lumber and they define the lumber of the well-established parameters, as I indicated earlier, including some of the C-reactive protein, lipids, and uh, fasting glucose, insulin, and whatnot. Uh, that was a total of 14 of them, and they defined it at the so-called allostatic low, essentially, uh, to capture it, uh, allow you to capture the total amount of adverse effects that measured by all these biomarkers that pick, they pick up, as you can see here, a clear difference by sex. In fact, the differences is even more so uh, especially in women when they pass the age of 60 or above. In other words, their risk of developing metabolic syndrome is even greater for women than for men. And this is our own works uh, guiding with these principles and we thought that, well, look, if we, we define the uh, metabolic syndrome instead of using HDL, but we use SHBG as a criteria to remove the sex differences. We all know that HDL also as an acute phase reactant that produced by the liver is actually protective, right? A lot of them uh, inversely related to heart disease, and yet women in general have higher HDL level than men. And then we, however, when we use the SHBG uh, level in this pa uh, panel, you can see the best panel is this, uh, the right-hand side, the upper right-hand side show most consistent associations with metabolic syndrome risk. This is uh, the enhanced data. Now, what's most interesting uh, is that you look at this uh, relationship of uh, a hormonal environment, uh, the sexual dimorphisms occurs not only in the adulthood, in fact, extend back to the um, um, uh, literally uh, perinatal, and I would even uh, argue perhaps for the first time we can see transgeneration effects, and this is also based on the women's health uh, study data, uh, where essentially we not only prove or we confirm the direct relationship between no birth weight as an indicator for the development of type 2 diabetes in the Women's Health Initiative, but we have six pathways that we have now established with uh, plasma measure of the biomarkers and using mediation analysis incorporating some of the genotypes, we can uh, quantify each one of those uh, pathways both from uh, adipocyte biology of leptin, leptin receptor, uh, sex steroid information, endothelial dysfunction, or even measuring the telomere links to uh, indicate cellular aging, uh, we identify, again, the sex hormone uh, pathway, uh, especially SHPG are the most important. Very quickly, to even extend this, uh, 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 this is the latest uh, data that we uh, collaborated with a group uh, in China, in northern China, where we uh, identify a cohort of families, either before, during, and after a family periods. Now we have actually have two generations of data, as you can see here, where uh, very quickly in the left-hand side, you see the maternal diet uh, versus the paternal diet a clear difference in terms of the exposure of FAMI or BMI of the second generations now, not the first generation, and this is the world's first data to show transgeneration effect, whereas the F1 generation, you can see clearly uh, a difference, uh, a, a effects on uh, both BMI, fasting glucose, and two-hour glucose response. Now, what all of this data mean to us as uh, nutritionists, uh, or particularly in carbohydrate intake, and this is what I come up with, this new idea or a, a little bit of provocative uh, hypothesis that I first presented um, in 2010 at the International Congress of Insulin Resistance, where Jerry Riven was actually sitting on the front row, 
we will argue that in fact there might be this kind of phenomenon what I call Ganando sensitivity that even happened perhaps a generation ago or two generation ago started at least where your body's ability to uh, deal with this sensitivity uh, are affected by both genetic, epigenetic or environmental uh, influence which then you know if you're more sensitive to it then your ability to handle this would be uh, better and, and as a result your risk of developing disease are, are lower and there's many examples that one can highlight there and given the interest of time I can't uh, t talk too much about it but suffice it to say that would allow us then you know focus on the SHBG to capture this and capture this meaning that you know if you treat SHBG as the center of attention then you can also evaluate the environmental as well as genetic influence uh, particularly some of the transcriptional factors that now uh, are getting picked up to increasingly uh, showing importance for the development of uh, cardiometabolic outcomes of interest. And this is one of the uh, uh, first efforts, uh, again, using the Women's Health uh, Initiative data that we have looked at. There's also age difference, we know, like sex differences, although this is actually somewhat uh, interestingly as folks age, and I have a reason for, uh, to explain why, that their um, SHBG level actually slightly uh, elevated. And then obviously it responds to estrogen, uh, estrogen level, physical activity, regular coffee intake. Uh, those are all positively influenced on the SHBG level, whereas uh, adiposity, glycemic low, glycemic index, sugar, and sugar sweetened beverage. This is all in the Women's Health Initiative very recently that we have uh, reported this data. So obviously, uh, for us, uh, and I think I can skip this, I already mentioned this. So this, say, a, this is the meta-analysis we did uh, showing clearly again the stronger uh, effects of a high glycemic low on type, uh, on, on type 2 diabetes, or this is on heart disease, right? on type 2 diabetes was clearly uh, uh, stronger in women than men. Um, same thing here when we look at SHBG with glycemic low. I think there's a lot of <laughs> uh, trying to get me stopped. So I can, I can actually uh, uh, stop here. And, and, uh, and, and this is a data which I, I show about three years ago of what, in the first uh, consortium meetings uh, from my colleague at UCLA where they uh, uh, mice genesis, uh, uh, showing that essentially in uh, about 100 different strains of mice, their, their response to the same diet. Uh, completely different. In fact, in fact, in terms of the, uh, in terms of building up their adipose mass, so I think it is important. Uh, let uh, uh, and this is the paper, and, and this is the paper that I also should mention uh, from the from the uh, Weizmann Institute that uh, published in a very high-profile journal uh, that created a lot of angst among folks. But I think it's a great uh, it's a great paper, although they uh, they also miss a few. Uh, important uh, uh, parameters like, for example, how did they actually build their so-called machine learning algorithms that they never tell you what exactly is the critical note they put into to build this uh, to predict people's glycemic response. But I will leave this uh, 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 conclusion in the last slides here and sorry to uh, extend it about minutes. Thank you for your attention.